Let us pray together. Lord, thank you that we can gather this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus. We thank you for the promise of his presence, that when we gather together in his name, there he is in our midst. Open our hearts and our minds, O oh Lord, to his presence. Make room, O oh Lord, in us for that which you desire for us to receive. And so we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's wonderful to be with you this morning. My wife and I were very much excited about coming. We remember last time, the warmth of your hospitality, the food after the service, uh, and all that we shared together. It was really a great morning, and so we're very, very glad to be here. As you know, since this is a time when four of this congregation are being received into this communion, they and you will make some very specific commitments. And I want to tell you ahead of time that the key word that you will hear again and again is the word service. In other words, they're making a commitment, and you in this service are reaffirming your commitment to really two things. One is the body of beliefs that's contained in the creed. Do you believe in God? I believe in God the Father. And we go back, question and answer, covering the content of the creed. So the first thing a commitment is being made is has to do with we have this in common. This is what we share, what we believe together, what in fact gives meaning to our lives. The second is to a set of behaviors. Will you, and the answer, and there's a list, and there are five of them, and we, I go back and you will say, I will with God's help. Because, and I've really been wrestling with this particularly recently, to make a commitment to these promises are lofty indeed. They're not easy. I, I hope they don't just sort of trip over your tongue out of repetition. They are worthy of pondering. Because a person who makes the commitment to do this literally requires nothing less than a reorientation of one's life. And the key to that is this. And it's actually my definition of who I think of as a mature Christian. A mature Christian may or may not be someone who has lived a long time as a Christian. A Christian may or may not be someone who can quote a lot of Bible or really knows his or her way around the church. They, in fact, may be able to quote a lot of scripture and sort of know their way and say, you know, be able to identify things like the stations of the cross or some of the other features in a service like this, or why we have the flags. And none of that means actually that they're mature. They may have some experience. But as anybody who's raised a child knows, experience and maturity aren't necessarily going hand in hand. <laughs> right? Not your head. So what is, what is maturity? Maturity literally is someone who has thought through what it means to be a Christian and is beginning to reorient his or her life toward that end. And the key is, and this is the definition of maturity, as someone who is not a Christian, my, most of my life is geared and oriented toward me taking care of me and mine. That's my purpose. That's my focus. And even if I'm a Christian, I actually look at the Christian life through that lens. In other words, I'm here, like I'm here at church, why? Because I actually get something out of it. See, that's for me. I'm here because I enjoy the people. Well, that's another thing that's for me, is it not? That's, that's not maturity. It's not that those things are bad, but that's not maturity. Maturity is a commitment to service. That's the key word. And a willingness out of that to say, Lord, how can I serve you? And that that's not just a question that one raises around stewardship time in a church calendar. 
but it actually becomes some, a way that we reorient our lives. So that first thing in the morning, what am I doing? Well, here's the difference, at least in my life. When I think of living for me, <laughs> what do I do? I look at my schedule. What am I supposed to get done today? What do I need to do? Are there obligations that I have? Should I be calling particular people? Or even things like, I know many of you watch TV, Marley watches a lot of television. We enjoy it. What do we do? We record the shows ahead of time, right? So that we can watch them. Well, all of that is a focus around the things that I like to do. Again, none of that is actually bad. But what's missing in that equation is, Lord, what would you have me do today? That's a very different equation. And actually beginning to cultivate an openness that God, in fact, might want to use you today. It can be in the simplest of ways. Making a phone call to somebody who needs it. And trusting that when that person's name pops into your mind, or you've written it down on your to-do list, that's something that you're actually supposed to do. A, a, a religious way of saying it, that's something that God is asking you to do. Whether it's convenient for you or not, it's actually secondary. This person needs a phone call. And you're willing to do it. You see, that's the fruit of... God, what would you have me do today? And I want to tell you that the most remarkable things can happen if you walk into your day thinking that way. You can wind up talking to strangers, even if that's not your proclivity, who will wind up telling you some rather remarkably personal things because they sense that openness in you. And that becomes an opportunity for you to say, not, I'll be thinking about you. No, you're a Christian. You're to be available for God. I'll be praying for you if you would like. See, that's a very, very different offer, isn't it? That kind of availability. You're prepared, in other words. I heard a story this week. I was at Canuga with a bunch of other people from the diocese getting ready for general convention. And I heard a man by the name of Don Johnson, who is the, not the TV star, but um, <laughs> he is in fact the present bishop in Tennessee. And he told a story, a true one in fact. This is a man by the, his first name is Tom, who was a Roman Catholic priest who had just found out that he was going to be made a bishop in the region where he had just been serving as the pastor of a local congregation parish. But the, his bishop said to him, you can't tell a soul, not even your mother. When it becomes public, everybody knows, but you can't tell anybody up until that point. So on the day that he knew that this was going to be announced on television, now that takes you back. Nobody announced on television when I was being there. <laughs> he got to his mother's house and they sat down and had dinner and pulled up you know, chairs, turned on the TV. The news came on, local news, and sure enough, it was announced that Father So-and-So, who is the pastor of St. Elizabeth's Roman Catholic Church, will be made a bishop in the diocese. He turned to his mother to see what her reaction would be. And she didn't say a thing. And finally he said, Mom, what do you think? She didn't answer. And then he got concerned. Mom, are, are you okay? She still didn't say anything. And then finally he said again, Mom, are, are you okay? They just announced that I'm going to be made a bishop on TV. And finally, she said very quietly, if I had known that you were going to be made a bishop, which means you would be on television, your picture is going to be in the newspaper, I would have paid to have your teeth straightened. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> Any of you who are Boy Scouts in the room, what's the motto of the Boy Scouts? Be prepared. <laughs> If you're going to be available for God to use you, it requires that kind of interior preparation. We don't naturally just sort of make ourselves available. God is at work, which is why even in the baptismal promises, we say, I will help with God's help. I need God to literally reorient my life 
so that I can begin to become available to other people in a way that is not just naturally, you know, my disposition, even if I'm one of those outgoing extroverts. But it is that sense of purpose of knowing that God actually has me on this planet for a reason. That can fuel and give creativity, imagination, and even joy to one's life. No matter how ambulatory you are, no matter how available you might be. I, I've told this story a couple of times. One of the women that I remember that has inspired me tremendously was a woman by the name of Beth Sullivan. Another true story. She, at the age of 97, fell off her exercise bike and broke her head. And therefore was confined to a wheelchair and went into a nursing facility. She was a parishioner at the church where I was the rector. So I went to see Beth. Well, I went to see her and I pulled up my chair. She was in bed and there beside her bed was her little Bible and prayer book. And I said, well, how are you, Beth? She said, I'm so mad. I said, why is that? Why would God have me in this awful place? And here's the thing, at the age of 97, she'd actually outlived most of her family. Her children were gone. She had a cousin or two. I'm sorry, not a cousin. A nephew who was still alive and lived in the area. And that was it. She had really outlived almost all, not just her husband, but all of her family. So here she is. She's confined. Would people go and visit her? Probably not, you see. And I said, well, Beth, I don't know what God has in mind, but here's what I do know. There are a lot of other people in this nursing home just like you. In fact, they don't have all their wits about them in the same way that you do. I mean, she was, in fact, smart enough to know that she was in a dilemma. And so maybe a part of why God has you here is because these people need you. Would you be willing to give yourself to that? Well, she heard it. She took it in. And what would happen is, when I'd go back to visit Beth, I couldn't find her. I'd ask the people at the nurse's station, do you know where Beth Sullivan is? Yeah, I think the last time I saw her, she was in her wheelchair going down the hall toward the end of visit so-and-so. Beth Sullivan lived until 105. And every time I met up with her, how are you doing, Beth? Well, I've just gone to see Albert, or I've just gone to see Marie. Well, what's happening with Marie? Well, here's the thing, Marie. She's not doing so well, but we prayed together. And, you know, I'm going to check upon her again in a couple of days. I mean, that nursing facility literally became her parish. And God used her in remarkable ways in the lives of other people. Actually, in a way that was not dissimilar to the line in the gospel reading. You know, the people are so overcoming Jesus that Jesus is family wonders if he still has all of his screws. You know, are you out of your mind? What is happening here? And yet Jesus was so profoundly committed to doing the will of his father, to doing the will that God had given him, that he didn't mind the personal sacrifice in a way that other people thought was crazy. Well, that was kind of how it was with Beth. And yet it gave her the vitality, the purpose, the imagination, the joy and it fueled her existence. Never mind that she was confined to find a wheelchair. No matter that she didn't get out very much. But the fact of the matter is, is that she opened, she was open to a literally nothing less than a new world inside that nursing home with people that she had never met. So it has nothing to do, you see, with age. It has nothing to do with how ambulatory you are or, or not. The question is, who do you live for? Do you live for yourself? Or have you made that commitment that it will be asked of you again in this service? I will. For what? I will be available for God's service. I will with God's help. What begins to happen to so many people as they continue to age is either their world gets smaller and smaller or it continues to grow and expand. And I want to say to you, it's not just a question of keeping alive your curiosity, although that's very important. It's much more deep than that. It has to do with availability and your willingness 
to be able to serve. It's that service that gives you the capacity to connect to other people. Whether it's convenient or not, or even despite how you're feeling. That's, that's why Paul could write in the epistle this morning. So we do not lose heart. Now man, this is somebody who went through extraordinary physical persecution. We will not experience anything like what it is that he endured. And yet he says, we do not lose heart, even though our outward nature, meaning flesh, we are, is wasting away. Our inner nature is being renewed day by day. How could he say such an extraordinary thing? When you get around most other people, what they do is give you their laundry list. How are you doing? Well, I had this surgery last week, and I'm not feeling so well. In other words, all they concentrate on is the state of their outward nature, right? And I get that because I have my own aches and pains too at this age. And it does become a preoccupation because you're not used to having that kind of physical limitation in your life. And you're not particularly happy about it, right? Not your head. I get that. But if that is your entire focus, then in a sense what's happening is that you're making the commitment to close your life off to the world in which God has placed you. And that only makes you grumpier and more of a complainer. It gets inwardly focused and extraordinarily myopic. No, the, the Paul could make the this light momentary affliction in the midst of the incredible things that he was going through, painful, outrageous things, because he was committed to one thing and to one thing only, and everything was secondary to that. And that had to do with his availability to God. So when we gather, as we are about to, please, as I said at the beginning, do not let these commitments just trip over your tongue. Look at the world into which you are being asked to serve and say, not just up here, but out of your heart, I will, with God's help, and see what God will do. Amen. Amen.